Where does the nerve to look down on others come from? Is it from the belief that one is the best, making others feel inferior? But isn't a person who can calmly reevaluate themselves to see if they're truly the best, the real strong one? My name is Alex. At first glance, it sounds like a boy's name, and I'm a bit dissatisfied with it as a girl's name. When I asked mom, she said it's from a person she respects, and that person happens to be a woman. Knowing the reason, I accepted it, but I still wished for a more feminine name. So until high school, I deliberately wrote it in a cute handwriting. I was born a fraternal twin, and being the first to cry, I'm the older sister, followed by my brother. Mom wasn't undergoing fertility treatment. It was a natural pregnancy, making the 0.2% chance of having fraternal twins quite rare. My brother was named Theodore, a boyish name that I secretly envied. Mom said she named him after a mentor she once had, and my brother seems to embody Mom's memories, growing up healthy and strong. I secretly wondered if I was becoming the child Mom hoped for. Dad is a doctor, a surgeon at a university hospital. He's a brilliant doctor who has successfully performed many complex surgeries. My brother admires Dad and has decided since he was little to follow in his footsteps. He excels in STEM, honing his skills at school, sparing no effort for his future medical studies. Mom is also a STEM person, and my brother seems to have inherited both their talents fully. I'm good at STEM too, not as much as my brother, but still better than most. Yet I also have a knack for the arts, not specializing solely in STEM. So in tests, even if I can't beat my brother in STEM subjects, I make up for it in the arts. And my brother, he's very skillful with his hands. In our elementary school home economics class, he effortlessly threaded a needle and did a perfect backstitch, earning praise from the teacher who said he could make a sturdy bag. In high school, dad told him about a suture practice kit and he started practicing stitching. I thought it was too early for such practice, but he was so eager to become a skilled surgeon that I couldn't help but be overwhelmed by his brilliance. At that time, I was deepening my interest in medicine, fascinated by its crucial role in preventing and curing diseases. Leading not just supporting medical care, I saw its vast potential. Pharmacology requires not just STEM skills, but also the ability to build logical arguments which suited me well since I excelled in both STEM and arts. Awakened to this interest, I started buying books about drugs, learning the basics, and various types. I was in the ninth grade then, filled with joy at having found my passion, just like my brother. When we were in the 11th grade, Dad fell ill and was hospitalized. He joked, A doctor who can't even manage his own health. But Mom said he had been off for a while. Neither my brother nor I were overly worried about Dad's condition. We just hoped this busy man would finally get some rest. However, as his hospital stay extended well beyond the initial period, our anxiety grew. One evening, when Mom returned from the hospital, we confronted her with our fears and heard something we never expected. Dad had only a few months left. His blood circulation was failing affecting oxygen supply and waste removal, hindering life support. The cause was unknown, with no effective treatment, and he was weakening daily. Dad had told us not to visit his room much, but Mom revealed he didn't want us to see him weaken, which brought tears to my eyes. I understood Dad's feelings, but one day, my brother and I secretly visited him. We found Dad frail surrounded by medical equipment and tubes. He was asleep, with only the quiet hum of machines. The sight shocked us, but more than anything, we felt helpless and sorrowful. Two months later, on a hot day marking the start of summer, Dad passed away. Mom, my brother, and I embraced as we faced that moment. It happened as the heart rate monitor showed a flat line and the doctor confirmed Dad's passing by checking his pupils. The emotions of that time were indescribable, the doctor's words echoing in my head. With Dad gone, life for Mom and us began as a trio. I wanted to support Mom, who bravely faced our new reality. 
Dad had expressed his wish to donate his body for research to uncover the cause of his illness and find a cure. It was his strong will to help others suffering from diseases. To honor Dad's legacy, my brother vowed to become a doctor, and I reaffirmed my commitment to pharmacology. We studied more seriously than ever for our exams. Time passed, and my brother got into the medical school of the university hospital where Dad worked. While I was accepted into the state university's pharmacy program, our paths to continue Dad's legacy were now set before us. Filled with enthusiasm, I entered the university and went to the orientation. Learning about credit systems and required courses only boosted my excitement. After the orientation, as I was about to explore the campus, someone approached me. Hello, your name is? Peering at the document I held, she continued. Oh, it sounds like a boy's name. <laughs> Weird name. <laughs> What? I was taken aback by her abruptness. That's rude, don't you think? To call it weird? It's a precious name, given to me by my mom. It's not strange at all. Sorry, but isn't it odd for a girl? My name is Juliet, you know. Pretty, isn't it? Though her rudeness shocked me, I felt hurt because I'd always been self-conscious about my name since childhood. That's nice for you. Excuse me. I quickly realized I didn't want to interact with her, and tried to leave, but Juliet blocked my way, saying, Well, if you got into this university, you must be somewhat intelligent, even if not as much as me. What does your dad do? My dad owns a drugstore chain. He's a CEO. Dad was a doctor, but he passed away. What? You don't have a dad? You must be struggling, then. It seems reckless for someone like you to attend a university. Even a state one, without understanding your place. I have no need to explain my situation to her, I thought, barely holding back my words. That's none of your business. I'm here on a scholarship, so there's no problem. A scholarship? So you are struggling financially. Oh, and now that you mention it, your clothes do seem to scream poverty. Mine are from an exclusive high-end brand. I had decided to be as independent as possible so I applied for a scholarship and was selected. The selection process was challenging, but I cleared it with flying colors. The scholarship would waive repayment if I maintained excellent grades, which further motivated me to study hard. Just like me, my brother also earned a scholarship after clearing the selection process and is studying at the medical school. The clothes I'm wearing aren't high-end brands, but they're new for my university entrance, and they don't reflect poverty at all. Juliet, after saying what she wanted and laughing, left with a triumphant air. Judging and looking down on others, boasting about herself, and then leaving. I had never encountered someone like her, and it was a bit of a shock. Exhausted by the encounter with Juliet, I continued exploring the campus and came across club recruitment activities. I became interested in Pharmacology Research Club, and as I learned more, my interest grew, leading me to join. Blessed with great seniors and peers, my university life began to shine even brighter. The seniors recommended elective courses, and I crafted my schedule. All the subjects seemed interesting, and I couldn't wait for the lectures to start. When I went to the university store to buy textbooks and materials, I unfortunately bumped into Juliet, the last person I wanted to see. Seeing the textbooks I was about to buy, Juliet said, Oh dear, you're buying so little. It's not even half of what I'm getting. Planning to fail and repeat the year, are you? <laughs> I don't need to buy new ones. I received textbooks and materials from a senior who completed the courses last year. Along with the course recommendations, I had received used textbooks from a club senior. The textbooks were valuable, with key sections highlighted in red and helpful comments and notes written in them. What? You're using secondhand stuff given out of pity? Struggling to afford new textbooks? How pitiful. I can't imagine using old things. But I guess you have no choice, do you? <laughs> That's not it. The notes and comments from the seniors are really helpful. You don't get that in new textbooks. Well, well, let's just say that's your excuse. Being poor must be hard. I wouldn't know about that kind of hardship. She had firmly decided I was poor, and nothing I said seemed to reach her. Even if I were poor, ridiculing and looking down on someone is inexcusable. 
but that common decency seemed lost on her. I genuinely didn't want anything to do with someone like her. After that, I had fewer encounters with Juliet due to different elective courses, but in mandatory classes, I inevitably ran into her. Juliet would bother me whenever she felt like it, often with belittling remarks, and her insults intensified when she was in a bad mood. Still at university? Maybe you should just give up and drop out. I smelled poverty, and there you were. By the way, what does your mom do? Day labor must be hard, right? She hurled such words effortlessly, astonishing me with their harshness. Despite these encounters with Juliet, my university life progressed smoothly. My grades were decent, and I got along well in club activities and with friends other than Juliet. Although my brother was at a different university, I heard he was top of his class. As always, impressively brilliant. Now I've become a junior. At this university, joining a seminar from junior year is mandatory, designed for deeper engagement with our fields of study. I chose a seminar focused on exploring the direction and future of pharmacology, led by a leading professor in the field. It was popular, requiring a selection test, which I passed successfully. On the first day of the seminar, I faced an unexpected challenge. You're in this seminar too. Ugh, the presence of a poor person will lower its standards. I joined, thinking it would enhance my reputation. To my dismay, Juliet was in the same seminar. <sighs> I sighed and looked heavenward. During self-introductions, Juliet bragged without regard for the setting, causing dismay and disappointment among the others, though she seemed oblivious to it. I genuinely worried that her presence might lower the seminar's standards. Later, at a welcome party, Juliet caused a scene again. While talking to a senior about my family and expressing concern about my busy and tired mom, Juliet interrupted. A day labor is a hard life. That's hilarious. <laughs> Maybe you should work instead of being here to ease your life a bit. She had been drinking, making her rudeness worse, and barged into my conversation with the senior. The senior, being sensible and normal, reprimanded her. What an impolite thing to say. Enough is enough. But a drunken Juliet blamed me for being scolded by the senior, ranting and attempting to throw her beer on me. Fortunately, another senior stopped Juliet from throwing beer at me, but she continued to rant and cause a commotion. The professor was absent due to a conference, so the incident didn't escalate further, but it did result in Juliet becoming an outcast in the seminar. Believing I was the reason for her isolation, Julie continued to harass me. She restrained herself in public, but turned hostile when we were alone. Her reduced attendance in the seminar was a relief for me, but surprisingly, she never quit. She revealed her reasoning in one of her taunts. The seminars become dull because of you, but I'll stay enrolled to graduate and land a good job. It'd be better without you around. You're a nuisance. I wanted to retort. I'd say the same to you, but held back, realizing she was just clinging to the seminar for its benefits. She didn't seem much interested in studying, often out partying instead. Time passed, and I graduated successfully. Juliet, surprisingly, also graduated despite her frequent outings. She wasn't dumb. If she had focused more on her studies, she would have done even better. But she did pass the pharmacy national examination, which was impressive. She secured a job as a pharmacist. Meanwhile, my brother Theodore passed the medical licensing exam, and became an intern at the university hospital where Dad had worked. Proudly, he followed through on his dream, becoming an intern in the clinical training program for doctors, rotating through various departments before choosing his specialty. Theodore still has many challenges ahead, but he says the work is rewarding. He hopes to become a surgeon just like Dad. Nearly two years after graduation, I received an invitation for a seminar reunion Eager to see old friends, but apprehensive about meeting Juliet, I weighed the pros and cons and decided to attend. While enjoying catching up with familiar faces, Juliet appeared. Still looking poor, I see. <laughs> she said, her usual insolence unchanged. She inquired about my current situation. By the way, where did you end up working? I know you passed the exam, all high and mighty. 
I chose not to seek employment. Explaining myself to Juliet seemed tedious, but before I could start, she cut me off with a loud exclamation. What? You're not working? Unemployed, even after nearly two years since graduation? That's really bad for someone as poor as you. Like she had initially assumed I was poor, now she had convinced herself I was unemployed. Knowing how fixed her misconceptions were, I felt no urge to correct her. I'm working at the pharmacy department of a major hospital, attending lots of patients. I'm an ace pharmacist there. There she goes, bragging again, without anyone asking. And I'm getting married to a brilliant young surgeon at the hospital. Uh -huh. He proposed, insisting he wanted only me. Juliet's boastful tales continued endlessly. Though the content was trivial, I felt uneasy when I realized the hospital she mentioned was where my brother worked. You may never marry being poor, but envy me, <laughs> she said. My bad premonition turned real less than a week after the reunion. Unbeknownst to me, my brother Theodore had a girlfriend, and they were considering marriage. Mom knew, but I hadn't had much chance to talk to her or Theodore due to my busy schedule. And to my utter shock, Theodore's girlfriend was Juliet. The thought of her becoming my sister-in-law, even just by marriage, was horrifying. Could Theodore truly be happy with her? I wanted to reveal Juliet's true nature, but if Theodore was happy, I didn't want to interfere like a tattletale. A family meeting was set for Theodore to formally introduce Juliet. She didn't want to visit Theodore's home, so we met at a hotel restaurant. As soon as we sat down, Juliet glared at me. I can't believe Theodore's sister is you. Oh, I remember Theodore mentioning he attended university on a scholarship. That figures. What does she mean by that figures? Is she implying we're poor? I could predict Juliet's thought process all too well. But Theodore is an ace surgeon. He's different from you all. Plus, we're building our new house soon. Typical of a wealthy doctor, right? Theodore planned to build a new house for their married life so the wedding was set to happen after its completion. I asked Juliet why she refused to come to Theodore's family home. Well, it's just a modest house, and as a president's daughter, it's not a place for me to step into. I can be blunt with you, but I'd be more restrained with Theodore's mom. In essence, she didn't want to visit our poor home. Her mindset was predictably shallow. Half a year later, Theodore's new house was completed, and he moved in. He invited us, including Juliet, to show off the new place. Juliet, having arrived earlier than Mom and me, had already seen the house. She was in a good mood, impressed by its grandeur. Amazing, right? Just what you'd expect from a doctor like Theodore. Even more luxurious than my parents' house. Brand new, nothing to complain about. As we raised a toast to celebrate, Juliet made a shocking move. You live in a different world than me. We can't have poor jumps around. <laughs> she threw her glass of beer at me. I was stopped at the seminar's welcome party, but this feels refreshing. <laughs> her spiteful remembrance of that old incident gave me chills, but I remained calm because I knew what was coming next. Mom, laughing heartily, broke the news. What are you talking about? I built this house. Juliet's smug laughter ceased. What? But this is Theodore's house. She was visibly shaken, unable to continue. Do you think a new doctor just finishing his internship could afford this? Theodore handed me a towel and spoke to Juliet. How could someone as poor as her build such a mansion? You think mom is a day laborer, right? Poor you, with such misguided beliefs. Mom is a CEO of a company that runs a chain of pharmacies. Theodore explained. When he mentioned the company's name, Juliet trembled. That's impossible. No surprise there, as Juliet's father's drugstore chain was a subsidiary of Mom's company. Mom had taken over the business from my grandfather and expanded it, eventually acquiring Juliet's father's company. Like Theodore was inspired by our dad to become a surgeon, I was inspired by our mom, a top-notch pharmacist, to pursue the same career. Mom laughed and revealed, <laughs> I built this house. 
The kids got into university on scholarships, so I thought I'd prepare a house for them after marriage. Alex doesn't have a partner yet, so she'll have to wait. Mom, forget that. At the last family meeting, you were strained, and I was questioned by both of them. Mom investigated you after hearing about it. A seminar classmate of theirs, my friend, told me about Juliet's bizarre behavior. Third-party testimony is credible. As the conversation progressed, Juliet's face turned pale and trembled. I told Juliet's dad everything, and he apologized deeply. He said he'd disown you. I can't marry someone like you. Consider our engagement over. Wait, Theodore! Juliet pleaded tearfully, but Mom delivered the final blow. What's more, you've been involved in illegal activities as a pharmacist. We can't overlook that. Juliet burst into tears and collapsed, understanding the full implication. Mom's investigation revealed Juliet had been smuggling restricted drugs from the pharmacy, handing them over to outsiders. The pharmacy department of the university hospital has deep ties with Mom's company and Mom was consulting with the head of the department. There were small but regular discrepancies in the drug inventory, prompting an internal investigation. During her student days, Juliet associated with criminals, getting involved in the use and distribution of illegal drugs. Initially, she stole from the university's supplies, and after getting a job, she began taking drugs from the hospital's pharmacy. Following Juliet's graduation, the university tightened its drug management protocols. There's no excuse for such lax management, but exploiting it to commit crimes is inexcusable. Of course her actions are criminal and not something that can be simply apologized for. Juliet was arrested. I'm sorry for the trouble. My judgment was off. Theodore apologized. It's not your fault, Theodore. Lucky it was before the marriage. Live here with your future spouse. Next time, introduce me to someone nice. I'm busy and enjoying my research for now, so that might wait. After university, I pursued a master's degree on my professor's recommendation. I'm technically unemployed, as Juliet said, but I'm deeply engaged in research on a new drug, potentially effective against the disease Dad had. This research is a joint project with our university. It might fulfill Dad's hopes through your efforts. Mom's company is supporting it. Dad would be proud. I'm determined to continue this research, fulfilling my dream and Dad's legacy. I plan to pursue a doctoral degree, so receiving a house from Mom might wait a while longer. My two brothers and I have been close since we were kids. There's my eldest brother, who we call John, my younger brother, whom we call Steve, and me, the only girl in the family, going by Lucy. We're all in our 30s now, and I'm confident that our bond is stronger than most siblings out there. Part of why we were so close is that our parents both worked, and we always had to work together to get by. None of us were exactly good children. We each had our own missteps. Our mother often had to come to school for each one of us, and we got scolded at times. John was by far the worst among us. He was infamous in our hometown for being a troublemaker, and didn't bother with things like studying. He was always just goofing off and getting into trouble. Steve and I were different. Maybe it was because we had a cautionary tale right in front of us, but we both managed to avoid causing too much worry for our parents. We didn't attend any after-school tutoring and didn't put in much effort, yet we were always in the top 10 of our class. We probably just knew how to play the system. Lucy and Steve are doing great in school. Can't wait to see what the future holds. <laughs> Maybe you'll take care of me someday. <laughs> Just because you're good at studying doesn't mean you're guaranteed a successful future. <laughs> I'll be the most successful one among our classmates. You just leave it to me. Usually the ones who say that are the first ones to get married and settle down. I'm betting on Steve. <laughs> Even if I become successful, I'm not going to take care of you. We'd always get in these fun discussions. John was sloppy but had a kind heart and strong core. Steve was careful and responsible in everything he did. And then there was me always pushing forward without thinking too much about the future. We made a great trio. John enrolled in a public high school, but quit about half a year in and has been wandering around ever since. He never really had a stable job. He'd help out at his senior's auto repair shop or bars from time to time, just coasting along. Watching my brother like this, I felt a deep resolve to succeed because I was the reason why John ended up in evening school. 
On the day I got into a traffic accident, my injuries were serious. John worried about me and rushed me to the hospital. Worrying and caring for me so much, he ended up quitting high school. Deep down, I feel guilty about that. So I can't help but think if I become successful, I can help get John's life back on track. Around that time, I was always thinking about the future, about the path to success and its shortcuts. What could I do that would interest John? It had to be something that he could easily get into. When I started high school, I wanted to save money, so I began working a part-time job. No matter what you do, I thought you always end up needing money, so I worked hard to save as much as I could. Steve, have you seen John lately? I haven't seen him at all. It seems like he hasn't been coming home recently. Just as I thought. That fool. I wonder what he's up to. I hope he's not getting into trouble. Surely, with a family waiting for him, he'd think twice before getting involved in something dangerous. John didn't come home for several months. To ease our shared anxieties, Steve and I gossiped about John. Then a few months later, John came home nonchalantly. Where have you been? At least contact us. We were all worried. I'm sorry. I've been super busy with my part-time job. If that's the case, just say so. Lucy and Steve have been worried too. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> he told us that he had found a good job out of state where he stayed overnight and entrusted me with almost all of his earnings for the future. He asked me to combine it with the savings from my part-time job. I didn't understand the reason at the time, but he insisted, so I took care of the money. From there, John started to loaf around at home again without doing anything for a while. Even though he never got a full-time job, he started to work part-time occasionally, and our parents seemed content with that. After graduating high school, I wanted to study business administration thoroughly and decided to go to college. Fortunately, my excellent academic performance earned me a full scholarship, which was able to help my parents out a bit. My brother was also proud of me. Around that time, there was a change in John. John, how long are you planning on living like this? If you don't get a full-time job, you won't be able to marry the girl you like. Actually, there's a company that's been inviting me through a colleague, but I'm not sure. You have such an opportunity? What kind of company? Construction. It's the site where I went to work part-time a few months ago. I'm not sure if I want to do that for the rest of my life. It starts early in the morning. You should take it. If you have the opportunity, just go and give it your best shot. Being firmly pushed by me, John started working as a full-time employee the following week. It seemed to suit him better than expected, and contrary to our family's prediction, he continued without complaining or being late. Looking at John during this time, I decided to pursue a career in architecture. If I could establish a solid foundation in the only field that my brother, who had no higher education, had mastered, his future would surely be secured. While I was attending vocational school, I continued to work part-time and managed to save up enough money to buy a rather expensive car. Of course, I could do this because I was living with my parents all along, but even I was impressed with how much I was able to save. My mother was the one who understood my efforts to work hard to save money and supported me from behind the scenes. She always packed lunch for me during my vocational school days so I wouldn't have to spend unnecessary money. She really was cheering me on. After graduating from vocational school, I joined a well-connected company to network, earned countless certifications, and slowly prepared for independence while building relationships. John too had been tirelessly committed to his job, so I was able to concentrate on preparing to start my own business. Eventually, I was able to establish my own company, but I didn't invite John to join at the time. I couldn't afford to both go under, so I decided to keep an eye on things for a while. I plunged into work with all the preparation I had done up until now, working frantically. The team I had assembled were all excellent and worked well, and they were all followed my lead. We got off to a good start. It was a strong beginning. But around that time, John had moved out of our parents' house and started living alone, and I didn't see him that often. I myself was busy and I couldn't keep in touch often, but a year after starting my business, I officially offered him a position. John, my company is finally stabilized. I have something else I want to do next. I want to expand the business more. So I want you to lend me your power. Can you help me? There is nothing I can do. I want you to become the president of the current company and take command. What? That's impossible for me. <laughs> you need to look at who you're talking to. I'm seriously talking to you with full consideration. Besides the money you entrusted to me a while ago, I used part of it as capital when I started the company. I persuaded John and assigned him a secretary who seemed to get along with him to learn all the necessary things. In this company, I became the chairman and took on the role of supporting John. Then I started preparing for the next venture. It was my original dream. 
to create mini cafes that are so cute and photogenic that they won't lose to anywhere else. This had actually been a dream of mine since childhood. I was excited to start without compromising anything, studying a lot about the restaurant industry. At that time, my younger brother, Steve, began studying to become an architect. This was also an offer I made. Buildings designed by Steve with John in charge of construction. This was the ideal shape. Of course, it's my job to ensure we have enough work to sustain us. I have been preparing to actualize this plan in the near future. Around the time John stepped into his second year as the president of the company, he abruptly announced that he was getting married. Who is she? John doesn't seem to have the best judgment. I'm worried. I'll introduce her to everyone soon. We're looking forward to it. John getting married. I must confess, I felt more sadness than joy. We had always been the three of us, so the intrusion of a stranger gave me a sense of discomfort. But I knew I had to pull myself together and celebrate my brother's happiness. Later, when we had a gathering with both families, I met his girlfriend named Bella. I didn't oppose their marriage and things seemed to progress smoothly, but I felt an aversion towards her from our first interaction. Bella, I'm Lucy, John's sister. Please take good care of my brother. It's so nice to have a sweet sister. If you ever need anything, don't hesitate to ask. Uh, okay. Since I'm going to be the wife of the eldest son, I mean, the president of the company, you'll have to go through me from now on, okay? <laughs> Bella was the same age as John. She was working in an administrative role at one of our client companies. Her first impression was that she was a determined and assertive woman. Honestly, I thought our perspectives were a bit misaligned, and she was not my type. However, I did think that such a woman might be a good match for the somewhat naive John. Steve felt the same way, but we both decided to support their marriage for now. She seems a bit stern, but if John loves her, we'll support you guys. Good luck and be happy. Thanks, Lucy. A few years ago, I couldn't have thought about marriage, and nobody would have even approached me. <laughs> From then on, I was running around due to the new work we had started, and my days were quite busy. As for John, he was busy preparing for the wedding, partly because Bella wanted to have the ceremony sooner rather than later. And before we knew it, the wedding day had arrived. I hadn't seen Bella, let alone John, since the day we had met both families. John, long time no see. Sorry I've been too busy to make time, but today I'm here to enjoy. Today at least you can relax and enjoy the food and drink. <laughs> John getting married. I can't help but feel a little sad. We three were able to chat and laugh together for a little while before the ceremony. Seeing John's happy face, Steve and I felt relieved. The ceremony began and I was enjoying a leisurely and delightful meal while chatting with Steve and my parents for the first time in a while. The seating arrangement at the reception hall had the employees from the company positioned diagonally behind our family. They were also lively and it was during their conversation when the bride and groom went around the tables in order. John, Bella, congratulations on your special day. Thank you and thanks to everyone for coming. Thank you all for coming. From now on, my husband's employees are my employees. I expect you all to work hard for me. <laughs> I couldn't believe my ears. In the middle of the wedding ceremony, what could this bride be saying? Thinking about that, I couldn't help but retort. Bella, the employees are strictly the people of my brother's company. They are not your employees, right? Oh, I'm well aware of that. My cute, meddlesome sister-in-law will be my maid from now on. <laughs> With that, she laughed in a crude manner. Because everyone sitting nearby could hear her clearly, the atmosphere became chilly for a moment. The next moment, all the employees burst out laughing. What? I'm going to be the wife of your CEO. Are you making fun of me? Bella, stop it. Bella, are you aware of who our chairman is? Huh? Chairman? I wasn't introduced to such a person. I don't know. It seemed that John hadn't explained it to her, and she was ignorant of the fact and being rude to me. To everyone who knew the truth, it was natural for them to laugh at her. The reception hall had already become quiet, and the atmosphere had completely changed from the festive move it had been. I never thought you'd be the type to say such things in a place like this. I'm disappointed. Huh? I'm marrying you, the CEO, and I'm becoming the wife of the most important person. Isn't that natural? The reason I'm standing in this position today is all thanks to Lucy. She is the one who started the company and made me the CEO. Everything is Lucy's doing. The chairman is my sister. What? What is that? I was not told about this. She realized that she was the only one who didn't know the truth and was completely furious. No matter what she was thinking inside, she should have gone through this reception with a smile. I'm sorry, but knowing your true feelings, I've changed my mind. Please consider this marriage as if it never happened. <sighs> John, that's a bit too much. I just lack judgment. My apologies, everyone. 
John bowed deeply to the people in the hall. The wedding ceremony ended abruptly and people dispersed. I later heard that she had lived in poverty since she was a child. She apparently told her colleagues that she would marry a rich man and lead a comfortable life. When she met John, she seemed determined to achieve that ideal life. After the ruined ceremony, Bella bowed her head many times pleading with John to reconsider, but John firmly stated he would never marry her and sent her away. While they were dating, Bella always appeared to respect and act quietly around John. But seeing her intimidating attitude towards others surprised him. He told me that he couldn't trust women and planned to focus on his job for the time being. His dedication to work increased and he started to do better and better. And my dream of expanding the number of our shops steadily came true. And Steve successfully passed his exam and became a proud member of our company. However, despite the professional success that all siblings have achieved, we are all still single, a bit of a sad situation. I remember when the three of us gathered together after a long time. Do you have someone in mind to marry Lucy? I enjoy my work and I can't think about marriage or having children yet. Me too. If we're happy now, that's all that matters. I don't want to get married either. So how about we build a house? John can come back and we can all live together. Caught up in work, Steve's suggestion surprised me for a moment. Over the years, we've been so focused on ourselves, it's time we repaid our parents and started looking after them. While the company is on track and has taken shape, we still need to work hard before we can declare it a success. Building a home as a base and starting from there together isn't a bad idea. I could easily agree with Steve's idea. Steve, that's great. What a great idea. Right? Steve, you handle the design. Lucy, you find the land. And I'll build a magnificent house. This was exactly the situation I had dreamed of, to achieve something with the three of us. We've been doing it since we were kids, but I always hoped we could continue this way into adulthood. My brothers and I. At that moment, I felt like there was nothing to fear in life ahead. Even if I don't get married or find a partner, I have strong allies. I'm sure I can continue to enjoy what I want to do with them. I'm Sophie, 28 years old. I met Mike at work when I was 24. We started dating and got married two years later. Along with our wedding, I quit my job to become a full-time housewife. It was a little sad leaving the workplace where we met, filled with such cherished memories. But the wonderful people there told me warmly, You're always welcome to come back. Since Mike and I worked at the same place, I fully understand the nature of his job. During the busiest season of the year, he's exceptionally overloaded and ends up working overtime almost every day. So I always make sure that all the chores are done by the time he gets home, just so he can relax. I do everything I can to support him, like giving him massages and filling our home with the calming scent of essential oils. Sure, we have our disagreements from time to time, but overall, we were leading a pretty enjoyable life. Then, one day, my younger sister, Mia, came to visit our apartment. It was a Sunday, so my husband Mike was home. Hey sis! I'm here to hang out with you! Mia's syrupy voice sounded from the intercom. I reluctantly opened the door, lightly pushing her away. What? You didn't tell me you were coming over. Oh jeez, you're just as cold as ever, sis. I came over because I have something important to talk about, she replied as she barged into our home. Hey, wait! Can't we just talk at the entrance? I called after her, but she didn't even look back as she went straight into the living room. I sighed. Oh, for goodness sake and reluctantly headed to the living room too. As you may have guessed, I'm not very fond of my sister Mia. You might be surprised to hear that, but you'll understand why soon enough. When I reached the living room, Mia was already seated on the sofa, fiddling with her phone. Hey, if you have something to talk about, get on with it already. Standing still. Then, Mike chimed in leisurely. Come on, she came all this way. Why don't you make her some tea? Just make it yourself, then. I didn't want to react out of anger, so I just snapped back at them in my head. So reluctantly, I went to make the tea. I made three cups of tea in the kitchen, and when I returned to the living room, for some reason, Mike was sitting next to Mia. Huh? Why is he sitting there? He usually sits next to me. As I felt something odd, I handed Mia her tea. Thanks, sis. I'm sorry for dropping by all of a sudden, she said. If you feel that way, then get to the point. It's Mike's day off today, after all. As I grumbled, Mia said something I hadn't expected. 
I know that, which is why I came over today. Ugh, what do you mean by that? As I was about to reply, Mike abruptly cut in. Sophie, I want a divorce. What? Divorce? Why so sudden? I felt as though time had stopped. I didn't understand what my beloved husband was saying. What did I just hear? Was I hearing things? Or was it a dream? Even as I frantically tried to make sense of the situation, there was no mistaking that Mike, my husband, and Mia, my biological sister, were sitting right in front of me. That's when I finally comprehended the fact that my husband was asking for a divorce. I reacted just like you would see in a comic or drama. What did you just say? And then, without changing his expression, Mike delivered the brutal truth. I got your sister Mia pregnant. So, I'm thinking we should divorce. Please let me go. He got Mia, my sister, pregnant? He didn't just want a divorce from me. He, a married man, had gotten my own sister pregnant. A wave of loathing anger and sadness towards Mike hit me, all at once, much later than I would have expected. Why? We agreed we would wait to have kids, didn't we? I managed to croak out, only for Mike to reply with a guilty look. I'm sorry, but I consider her more important than you right now. Beside Mike, Mia was smirking as she watched my reaction. How long has this been going on? I asked. Mia answered my question. Hmm, about six months ago? Remember when we all celebrated your birthday at our parents' house? I think that's when it started. Isn't that right? Ah, yes, that time. Half a year ago, I remember celebrating my birthday at my parents' house. At the time, my husband Mike and my sister Mia, who lived with my parents, were also present. We had a wonderful time together. As the birthday girl, I drank a lot and got pleasantly drunk. And then I fell asleep earlier than anyone else. They said their relationship began that day. When I was completely drunk, Mia took advantage of the situation. Initially, it seems that Mia was the one who made advances, and Mike rejected her. However, after her relentless pursuit, Mike gave in, and they began meeting regularly. Without my knowledge, they nurtured their love for these past six months. As a result, Mia, my sister, got pregnant with Mike's child before I did, and I am his wife. Mike chose Mia, with whom he only had a half-year relationship over me, his wife. What? I don't understand. Why? How? Anger, misery, sadness, a mix of all these emotions turned my head into a whirlwind. However, pursuing the details would not change their relationship. The fact that Mia is pregnant and Mike wants to divorce me are all realities. While I was wrestling with my emotions, Mia snorted with laughter. Her despicable attitude infuriated me even more. Well, I do feel bad for you, sis, but hey, can't help it if I fell in love, right? Mia said. Can't help it? What are you talking about? What about this situation is unavoidable? Unable to suppress my emotions, I raised my voice. Well, it can't be helped, right? Even now, the baby in my belly is growing healthily. Can you quickly come to terms with that? Mia retorted. I don't care about that. This would not have happened if you hadn't made a move on Mike. But it's pointless. The more I say, the more miserable I feel. No matter how much I blame Mia, it doesn't change the fact that Mike chose her. Mia is pregnant with his child. He accepts that fact and has prioritized his future with Mia over me. Once I accepted that, for some reason, I had nothing left to say to Mia. Seeing this, Mia exchanged a glance with Mike and smirked. Mia, I want to talk to Mike alone. Could you leave us, please? I said in a tone colder than I'd never used before. Left alone with me, Mike looked incredibly awkward. Hey, do you really love Mia? I asked. And without making eye contact, Mike nodded slightly. Speak up! Are you considering marrying Mia because she's pregnant? 
Or did you plan to be with her instead of me from the beginning? I pressed Mike for a clear answer. Finally, he opened his mouth. At first, I thought it was okay as long as we didn't get caught. When she got pregnant, I thought I had to take responsibility. That's why I decided to marry her, and that means I have to divorce you. I was deeply disappointed. I thought he would have made a more solid resolve. Such a pathetic reason. My own husband. What a ridiculous man. Rather than sadness or anger, disbelief took over first. Concealing my emotions, I just said, I see, and left the room. Huh, so, that's the end of my married life with Mike. It ended. Just like that. I murmured to myself in my room. It was a ridiculous and miserable marriage. I've disliked Mia for as long as I can remember, because she always took everything that was important to me. Clothes and accessories were one thing, but she even stole my boyfriends when we were growing up. Whenever I confronted her, she would fake cry and get everyone on her side. When I finally bought the bag I'd wanted for so long after working part-time, Mia used it without my permission when I wasn't home and ended up breaking it. When I asked her to compensate me, far from showing remorse, she mocked me. What are you saying? I just used it because it doesn't suit you, you know? Who cares if it's broken? That bag didn't suit you anyway. My anger peaked at my sister's words, and when I yelled at her, she ran straight to our parents. Dad! Mom! Sophie is picking on me! Mia would put on a huge crying act, and I could only sigh in disbelief. What? You're the one who used my stuff and broke it! I didn't mean to! It was so cute! So I just borrowed it! Our parents never questioned Mia's fake tears. On the contrary, they blamed me alone. As the older sister, you should be kinder to Mia. That's right, you're the older one here. Stop acting like a child. Mia grinning from a hidden corner as my parents blamed me, angered me even more. My parents never listened to my side of the story, always taking Mia's side. In the end, Mia got everything done her way. That's right, she was always the one setting up a situation where I seemed like the villain. Always watching, grinning as the older sister who made the younger one cry was blamed. I despised Mia. As an adult, I kept my distance from Mia as much as possible. That's why, even when I was about to get married, I kept it a secret from Mia until the last minute. Yet, I never expected her to steal my husband. I'm sure she doesn't truly love my husband. Just like that, when she stole my boyfriend, she couldn't stand the fact that I was happily married. That's the kind of person my sister is. Before I could calm my emotions, Mia entered my room. Are you done talking with Mike? Mia grinned as usual. Sorry, but can you please not come in without permission? Wow! But, well, that's that. You guys are having a divorce, right? This house and Mike. Everything is mine now. You're in the way, Sophie, so pack up your things quickly and leave. Mia brought her face even closer and said, There's no way you could win against me, you idiot. The grin that was on her face until a moment ago was gone, replaced by a clear expression of looking down on me. After berating me to her satisfaction, Mia returned to the living room with a triumphant expression. At that moment, the black devil inside me woke up. Enough is enough. I can't take this anymore. She's nothing to me. Not even my sister anymore. She's just a wicked woman. I've put up with this for far too long. But this is the limit. I won't let things go her way. I'll ruin Mia's life. I returned to the living room and declared loudly to my husband and sister. I'm not divorcing! What? What are you saying, Sophie? What do you mean, Sophie? Why are you saying that now? In front of me were my husband and sister, shocked at my words, but I didn't care what they thought anymore. Do you hear me? I'll say it again. I'm not divorcing. Do you think I would just agree to divorce because you're pregnant? You think I would just say, okay, and let it happen? Mike widened his eyes in surprise, and Mia looked a bit flustered. Huh? Are you stupid? There's no way I'd let things go your way. Harsh words came out one after the other. Even I was surprised. Sophie, 
What are you saying? Do you understand the situation? I'm pregnant! Pregnant? So what? I could clearly see my sister's distress. Serves her right. Whether you're pregnant or not, that's not my concern. I won't agree to a divorce, and if you're not satisfied, we can go to court. C court Isn't that a bit too much? My husband's face twisted at the mention of court, as though he was frightened by the idea. I stood my ground against my sister, who had turned pale. Also, we're done. For me, you're no longer a sister or anything, just my husband's mistress. And, of course, I'll be demanding compensation for distress, so prepare yourself. At my declaration of cutting ties, my sister wore an expression of despair. She looked as if she had aged decades in an instant. I'd never seen her look like this before. It seems my words were hitting home. Finally, I had my revenge. It filled my heart in a strange way. I dragged my collapsed sister to the door, tossed her personal items outside, and told her, Get out and fast! If you linger here any longer, I'm calling the police! She gritted her teeth in frustration, hurriedly gathered her scattered belongings, and left. I then turned to my husband, who was hanging his head in defeat. Just so you know, I'll be demanding compensation from you too. True to my words, I hired a lawyer and finished various legal procedures. After dragging out the divorce proceedings, I finally divorced my husband, once my sister had given birth. My sister and husband were elated, saying, we can finally be together. But they're so naive. The world isn't that sweet, is it? I timed it perfectly, returning to my old job. Of course, I told the company everything that had happened. I was immediately rehired, having been a dedicated worker, while my husband, who worked at the same company, was met with disdain from everyone. Did you hear he got his sister-in-law pregnant while still married? That's disgusting. His ex-wife is the one who recently came back to work, right? I feel so bad for Sophie. Couldn't stand it if it were me. The gossip about my husband was all over the company. Of course, I made sure to spread the news everywhere I went. Feeling uncomfortable at the company, my husband voluntarily resigned a month after my return. He apparently lived in an apartment with my sister afterward, but due to financial constraints, they soon had to move into a smaller apartment. My sister didn't want to downgrade her lifestyle and cried to our parents for help. However, I had already revealed everything to our parents at the same time. Our parents, who always sided with my sister, were furious this time and declared they were cutting ties with her. How dare you sleep with your sister's husband? That's right! And to become pregnant with your sister's husband's child? How are we supposed to face the neighbors? Both our father and mother were livid. Even my sister should understand that she won't be receiving any more help from them. I may have gone too far. Am I too ruthless? But compared to what that wicked woman did to me, this is nothing. I managed to let off some steam at my parents, who always spoiled my sister, and I was able to recover the compensation for distress from both my ex-husband and sister. Now that I'm back to my old job, I have no financial worries. Now it's their turn to experience hell. They ruined my life enough. From now on, I'm going to prioritize my own happiness and live a fulfilling life. Hey, what's going on? This is not what we discussed. Quiet down. I don't want to drop out at my son's wedding. Well then, I won't come. This is an unthinkable incident that occurred at my brother-in-law's wedding. My name is Caroline. I'm a 30-year-old working housewife. I married my husband, Stephen, five years ago. We're thinking it would be nice to have children at some point, but for now, we've decided to concentrate on our careers. I was raised in a single mother household. My father passed away due to an illness when I was in elementary school. It turned out to be cancer. To pay for the high medical expenses, my mother worked tirelessly, and unfortunately, it took a toll on her health. Even after that, she kept working to raise me, but by the time I was in middle school, she could hardly work. Her health had seriously deteriorated, and she could only imagine to work part-time a few days a week. But my mother, who had lost her husband and had no other relatives, 
had no choice but to work to raise me. I wanted to go to high school, but the desire to help my mother was stronger, so I decided to work after graduating from middle school. However, when my homeroom teacher found out about this during a career guidance session, he naturally opposed my decision. Caroline, it's going to be tough for you to start working right after middle school. The future options will be limited. At least, you should consider high school. But I want to start working as soon as possible to ease the burden on my mom. Caroline, there are scholarships available now, and you can go to night school or take correspondence courses while working during the day. There are many options, so think it over. I'll return this career guidance form to you, so please write at least two other career options besides getting a job and hand it in within the week. I reluctantly took the form returned by my homeroom teacher and decided to research on the internet using my mother's cell phone when I got home. When I started typing in the search window, I saw search stories that my mother had probably looked up. High school scholarships, financial assistance, for non-taxable households, high school welfare benefits. I was curious, so I decided to search for them. Then I found out that there are indeed scholarships and various other systems available, just as the teacher had said. And for households on welfare, it seems that money needed for school supplies and tuition fees are also provided. I might be able to go to high school without burdening my mom. I was not entirely uninterested in further studies to begin with, so I began to hope a little. I decided to compare each system and opened the search history. And below the pages I had searched, there was something incredible. There were histories of question and answer sites and city websites my mother had searched for. Search history showed signs of keyword searches for welfare application, conditions to receive welfare, what to do when denied welfare, and not allowed to apply for welfare. These search histories seemed like cries from my mother's heart to me. Perhaps my mother had researched for my sake, learned about welfare, but was turned down at the counter and couldn't receive an application. Seeing this, I just couldn't think or research about going to high school anymore. And then the weekend came. When my homeroom teacher asked me, Have you thought about your career path? I replied that I simply couldn't consider going to high school. As expected, my teacher looked dissatisfied. Though no further guidance came during that moment, my mother received a call from the school in the evening. After hearing the situation from my teacher, she confronted me. Why are you thinking about getting a job? If it's about money, I'll figure something out. Please, just go to high school. I responded, But mom, you know you've been denied welfare, right? I know going to high school costs more than a scholarship can cover. How did you know? I saw it when I borrowed your cell phone. Since dad passed away, it's been just you and me. What am I supposed to do if something happens to you? Please don't push yourself anymore. I'll work once I graduate to make up for all the hard work I've put in. Tears streamed down my mother's cheeks at my words. The person who was probably the most worried about my education and our finances was my mother herself. Sobbing, she hugged me and kept repeating, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Thus, due to my strong will, I decided to work right after graduating from middle school instead of proceeding to high school. However, finding a job as a middle school graduate was very difficult, as most job postings required at least a high school or an associate's degree. Even if the job didn't require a certain level of education, an ordinary middle school graduate with no qualifications would likely be rejected during the paper screening process. Eventually, I ended up working part-time until 6 p.m. after graduating from middle school. One day, I was called in for a meeting by my boss, who proposed that I work as a full-time employee once I reached the age equivalent to a high school graduate. According to my boss, my diligent work ethic despite my young age had been noticed. There were some conditions to meet, but I gladly accepted the offer. Afterwards, I fulfilled the conditions set by my boss and was promoted to a full-time position in April of the year I turned 19. Despite many hardships, my life was sailing smoothly. It was around this time that I met my current husband, who I was introduced to as a business partner. We got closer through work meetings and began to discuss personal matters. He also lost his father in a traffic accident and was raised by a single mother, similar to my situation. 
We clicked instantly over our shared experiences, which eventually led to a relationship and marriage. When we went to meet his mother, she initially welcomed me, but turned hostile when she learned that I was a middle school graduate. I can't believe you didn't even go to high school. We may be a single mother family, but I managed to send Stephen and his brother Robert to high school and college. Even if it required scholarships, it was possible to attend high school. What was your mother doing? Mom, that's no way to talk. Our circumstances were due to an accident, and we also had compensation from the other party. Caroline's family has its own issues. It's not fair to compare like that. If you do your research and follow the proper procedures, there are many grants and supports available. No offense, but it makes me think either she had poor grades that prevented her from going to high school, or both mother and daughter are simply ignorant. Either way, she's no good as your wife. I can't approve of a marriage with such a woman. The harsh words I received had left me deeply frustrated. My brother-in-law, Robert, had mocked me incessantly for only having a middle school education, making acceptance by my husband's family seemingly impossible. Eventually, we defied their approval and got married, sort of eloping, and had a private ceremony. Given the circumstances surrounding our marriage, my husband and I found ourselves largely estranged from his family. Nothing improved over time. Our relationship was merely superficial, limited to basic greetings. Then, one day, we received a phone call from his family. Hello, Stephen. Robert is getting married. They are planning a wedding ceremony, and we were wondering if you and Caroline could attend. Just like that? Out of the blue? What a turn of events. After treating Caroline so coldly all this time, you guys sure are feeling generous now, aren't you? I do apologize for that, but Robert's bride-to-be insists she wants blessings from all the family members. Please, for the sake of your mother. Stephen and I discussed it at length and decided that if this could be a chance to mend relations, we would attend the wedding as his mother wished. On the day of the ceremony, my husband was asked to come earlier than planned to help out, so we ended up going separately. Although they told me it was okay to arrive just in time for the start, I decided to go a bit earlier so I could greet my in-laws. However, when I arrived at Hotel A as instructed on the invitation, there was no sign of a wedding taking place and there was no one else around, just for a wedding. So, I decided to ask the hotel staff. Excuse me, I have this invitation for a wedding here? The staff member gave me a puzzled look and said, Could you please wait a moment? And went to the back, leaving me to wait for a while. After waiting for a bit, the staff returned with a response I could not have anticipated. I'm sorry, but there are no weddings scheduled at our hotel today. What? But it clearly states this hotel's name, right here. I double-checked the invitation with the staff, but the hotel's name printed there was undoubtedly correct. Just then, my phone rang. It was Steven. Caroline, where are you? I'm at the desk of Hotel A. Steven, where are you? They are telling me there's no wedding here today. Why are you there? Didn't you get the call from my mom this morning? The schedule and venue have changed. What? I didn't receive any such call from your mom. No way. Hold on, I'll get there as soon as possible. Where is it and when does it start? It's at the chapel in Hotel B. The ceremony starts in 20 minutes, but I don't think you can make it in time from there. The location Stephen gave me was on the opposite side from Hotel A, past our home. The turn of events led me to believe this was his mother's doing. Stephen, can you hand the phone to your mom? I decided to confront her directly over the phone. Hello, Caroline. Why are you calling at a time like this? We're quite busy. Don't play dumb. What's going on? I just got a call from Steven and the story doesn't match up. The time and location of the ceremony are totally different from what we were told. And you lied about contacting me. What are you trying to do? You're such a nuisance. Even if you're not the brightest, try to read the room a little. Your presence would spoil a special occasion like this, and it's embarrassing to have a dropout, so don't come. Fine! Depressing my frustration, I reached out to a certain person. Meanwhile, in the groom's waiting room at the wedding venue, Stephen was having a heated argument with his mother and brother. Mom, how can you say that to Caroline? And Robert, why was the content of the invitation sent to our house different from the others? Were you deceiving us from the start? Huh? What are you talking about? As long as you're here, everything will look fine, and it won't be a problem even if the dropout isn't here, right? Don't you dare! 
Stop belittling my wife any further. Steven, Robert, both of you, stop it. This is right before the important ceremony. Who do you think caused this massive bride harassment at this important ceremony? At that moment, there was a knock on the waiting room door. Outside the door were Robert's bride-to-be and her parents. I heard that you declined Caroline's attendance. Robert, can you explain why this has happened? Uh, there's a reason for this. It's embarrassing, but my brother's wife only has a middle school education, so she's not the kind of person who should be here. That's right. My eldest son's wife, Caroline, is a dropout. But my son went against my wishes and married her. She and her mother lack common sense and are a disgrace to our family. It's too embarrassing to invite such a daughter-in-law here. At the words of Robert and his mother, the bride covered her mouth with her hand, and her parents exchanged glances with clouded expressions. Robert, even if it's true, there are things that are acceptable and things that are not acceptable in society. The bride's father said so, showing the screen of his smartphone. What? How did you get a hold of that? What the bride's father showed to everyone present was the image of the invitation sent from the in-laws to us. Actually, the bride's father is my former boss. Although he is no longer my direct boss due to a transfer, he was the one who did everything he could to help me get promoted, and I owe him a lot. Also, the bride had once worked part-time at my workplace, so I was acquainted with her. It seems that you and your son have a misunderstanding. My daughter and I know Caroline very well, and she's not the person you describe. She was a child who struggled with her family environment, but she's always been a dutiful daughter who loves her mother. She never forgets to be considerate to those below her, and she took good care of my daughter when she was working part-time for work experience. What? But... As Robert stammered, this time the bride spoke. What my father says is true. When I was in high school, I used to work part-time at his office. Being young and naive, I wasn't well-liked by my co-workers. But Caroline always stood up for me. She also helped me when I was being bothered by a difficult customer and she always took the time to explain things that I didn't understand at work. My father and I are truly grateful to Caroline, and to think that someone would treat our benefactor in such a way. At the bride's words, her mother-in-law was shaking with anxiety. She began to shout, obviously at the end of her patience. Well, education is important, isn't it? I made sure my sons were well-educated, so I wouldn't be ashamed to introduce them anywhere. Even made sure they graduated from college. And, in this day and age, to only have a middle school education? Unless there's a very good reason, it's expected to at least graduate from high school. If they can't do that, it's simply a lack of effort on the part of both the individual and the parents. There was indeed a very good reason. At least for Caroline and her parents. And she, having joined the workforce right after middle school, worked hard. Didn't you hear from Caroline herself? She acquired her high school equivalency diploma as part of the requirements for her promotion. Actually, I took a high school equivalency exam as a requirement to be promoted to a full-time position. The exam covered the content equivalent to three years of middle school and one year of high school. As I had been away from academic studies, I had forgotten even some of the things I had learned. I studied between work and after returning home, sometimes getting help from others and somehow managed to prepare in time for the exam. The content was mostly basic, and I passed with flying colors. A high school equivalency exam is a national examination, and passing it means the government recognizes you as having the same level of academic abilities as a high school graduate. Can you please stop referring to Caroline as a dropout from now on? It's unpleasant. And I can't possibly allow my precious daughter to marry into such a horrible, abusive family. It's fortunate that the wedding reception and the registration of the marriage haven't happened yet. We'd like to pretend this wedding never existed. Meanwhile, at the wedding venue, unaware of the drama unfolding behind the scenes, the guests were anxiously waiting for the reception to start. However, as time passed with no sign of the ceremony beginning, the venue staff began to hurry about. An uneasy atmosphere began to spread, and the guests started to feel suspicious. Then, a solemn voice came over the speakers. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience. Unfortunately, the wedding scheduled for today has been cancelled due to unavoidable circumstances. The bride's father has a message for you. I'm the bride's father, as introduced. Despite your efforts to adjust the schedule for today's occasion, 
I deeply apologize for the sudden turn of events, and I am sorry to inform you that due to the discovery of malicious harassment from the groom's side, the marriage has been called off. I take full responsibility for not noticing this until now. The reception has been cancelled, and we will proceed with a simple dinner. All the wedding gifts will be returned, so please be assured. I am terribly sorry for the inconvenience. After finishing his speech, he bowed deeply. How dare you! I was looking forward to this day so much! The discontented mother-in-law stormed the venue, causing a commotion, but was restrained by the staff and dragged off to a side room. The guests left at the reception venue found themselves in an awkward predicament. Some, in a spirit of might as well, carried on with their meals, while others, made uncomfortable or feeling unwell by the incident, decided to leave. Stephen, being a member of the family, went around apologizing to the guests and thanking the bride's father before heading home early. This debacle was caused by Stephen's family and resulted in a broken engagement. As a result, Robert and the rest of his family decided to cover all the costs, including the reception fee, the transportation costs for the guests, and an additional compensation for the bride's side. Due to this incident, my mother-in-law started receiving judgmental looks from relatives. Robert, who had invited his colleagues to the wedding, also found his standing at work had deteriorated. When we got home, my husband apologized to me repeatedly. Caroline, I'm really sorry about my family's behavior, he said. It's okay, it's not your fault, Stephen. I want to make things right. I've decided to cut all ties with my family over this incident. I'm utterly disgusted. We live quite close to my mom's house, so... How about we move closer to your mom and start over in a new place? If it's okay with you. We could live with your mom. Really? Thank you, Stephen. I agreed to Stephen's proposal and we started to live with my mother. Our interactions with the bride's family have resumed, surprisingly in a pleasant way, all thanks to that chaotic reception. Life is unpredictable, isn't it? If you can't even clean properly, maybe you should just have an abortion. I mean, it doesn't bother me either way. How could you say such a thing? Unforgivable. Just too far. My name is Alicia. I'm in my late 30s and I'm a company worker. I've been married to my husband Kevin for five years now. We don't have any kids yet. When we were getting married, Kevin said, We're not getting any younger and we both want kids, so I'd like you to stay at home and quit your job. But I just couldn't give up my current job, so we've both been working. Now Kevin understands how I feel and we're living harmoniously, sharing household chores. Even the notion of moving in with my in-laws was brought up once. My mother-in-law used to be a teacher. She said that when Kevin and I have a child, she'll help so I can continue working while raising the child. Her parents helped her when she was raising her children while working and she wanted to pass on the support. For now, we're leaving things at, we'll think about it once we're blessed with a child. Kevin is quite dominant and expects me to follow a step behind him, especially around his family. Despite that, he is inherently kind and we maintained an equal relationship at home. Lately, my health has been less than stellar. My stomach has been upset, I've been suffering from dizzy spells, and I'm irritable. At the end of my workday, I'm exhausted and I can barely manage the household chores. Kevin has been very concerned despite being tired from his own work. He helps with my share of chores, asks me what I feel like eating, and even goes out of his way to buy it. However, my health kept deteriorating, so he said, You should see a doctor. If it's too much to go alone, I'll accompany you. I'm worried, please. He accompanied me to the doctor, and it turned out that I was pregnant. The cause of my poor health was morning sickness. Both Kevin and I were overjoyed at our long-awaited pregnancy. We thought this morning sickness would surely calm down soon. However, even after a month, two months, my morning sickness did not subside. I learned that the severity and duration of morning sickness vary greatly among individuals and some people even suffer from it until they give birth. My health worsened day by day. I managed to go to work, but I could no longer do any housework after returning home. Seeing this, Kevin began to grow cold towards me. Why isn't your morning sickness over yet? It's not an illness, is it? Are you pretending to suffer so you could slack off from housework? I don't know why either. Why would you say such terrible things? That's harsh. My mother said she never had morning sickness. My colleagues at work said it was over quickly and they were doing housework. Alicia, you're just being lazy. If you toughen up, you won't feel morning sickness, right? You're lacking determination. I wanted to argue back at Kevin who compared me with his mother and others, accusing me of slacking off, but I didn't have the energy to do so at the time. 
I was coming home from work, barely managing the household chores, while feeling dizzy and sometimes vomiting in the toilet. Kevin would finish his share of the chores, then he'd lie on the sofa, watching TV and laughing while I was desperately trying to do the housework. Even when I asked for a little help, he would say, At least take responsibility for your own work. Morning sickness isn't an illness. If you pull yourself together, you can handle it. It's only hard because you think it is. If you're like this with morning sickness, how will you manage childcare? And wouldn't help me. After a while, Kevin fell asleep on the sofa and his smartphone slipped from his hand. The screen showed a message asking, Has Alicia's slacking off habit been cured? I was furious. Using Kevin's finger while he was sleeping, I unlocked the fingerprinted protected phone and I found numerous emails from my mother-in-law in the mailbox. Has Alicia's slacking off habit been cured? She's just using morning sickness as an excuse to slack off. She's planning to slack off in her work and housework. You have to hit her hard. I see. I'll tell her. I've never had morning sickness at all. As long as you're careful, you'll be fine. I see. I'll tell Alicia too. Morning sickness is nothing compared to childcare, which is a hundred times harder. I'm worried about what will happen after the baby is born if she's like this now. That's troublesome. They also talked about how I was too old and questioned whether a healthy child could be born. They even suggested Kevin should remarry a younger woman who would not suffer from morning sickness and would bear a healthy child. You don't have such a partner in mind, do you? Oh, if you feel like it, I'll introduce her to you, okay? Her name is Mona. She's my student and she's 25 now. She admired me and became a teacher. She's so cute. It's fulfilling and it doesn't have to be a burden on you, Kevin. If it's Mona, I think she'll definitely do it if I ask her to live with me. I wouldn't mind if you introduced me to her. They even made plans for a meal with Mona, one of my mother-in-law's former students. Regularly, they were bad-mouthing me. I managed to take a picture of all the emails and save them when I had a chance to check Kevin's phone. I was stunned for a while and couldn't comprehend what I had seen, but I felt I understood why my husband had grown colder towards me. That day, I couldn't get out of the toilet from morning till evening. My morning sickness showed no signs of calming down, and my throat was sore from all the vomiting. I worried whether the baby in my belly was alright given my condition. Recently, I have barely been able to eat solid food and have just been managing to stay hydrated. Feeling my limit, I was about to call Kevin from the bathroom for help when he showed up at the bathroom door by chance. I am really suffering today, please take me to the hospital. Maybe an IV drip will make me feel better. Why are you fussing over a little morning sickness? It's already enough! I have plans today, please don't bother me. I remembered today he had plans to dine with my mother-in-law and Mona. I wanted to tail them, but that seemed out of the question now. I plan to go out in the evening, but seeing you, Alicia, depresses me. I'm leaving now. I can't even relax in my own house. Just keep slacking off alone, alright? Why are you always so cruel? The child inside me is ours, Kevin. Can't you cooperate or help a little? <laughs> if morning sickness prevents you from even cleaning properly, maybe you should just get rid of the child. I don't really care either way. You're choosing to have this baby, Alicia, right? Then stop complaining and handle your business. Just don't burden me, okay? As I heard his words, my consciousness began to drift away. I couldn't muster any strength. When I woke up, I was in a hospital. My parents looked at me worriedly. What had happened? Apparently, when I was trying to call Kevin from the bathroom using my phone, I accidentally dialed home. My father answered the phone and overheard Kevin's harsh words. My parents rushed to our place immediately and found me collapsed alone in the bathroom. Kevin had left me unconscious and gone out. My parents quickly called an ambulance and I was taken to the hospital. Fortunately, both I and the baby were okay, but I was advised to stay in the hospital for a night just to be sure. My parents tried to reach Kevin, but he was unresponsive. He had read the messages but didn't reply. He didn't show up at the hospital that day. I told my parents everything, sobbing. I showed them all the photos from Kevin's phone. My father, deep in thought, said, We need to talk with Kevin and his parents. The next morning, when I was about to be discharged, Kevin finally showed up in my hospital room. Kevin, grinning, said, Seriously? What are you being hospitalized for? You just stayed one night, right? See, I told you, your morning sickness isn't a big deal. Let's go home now. Kevin, wait a moment. The doctor told me something earlier. I got a medical certificate that recommends rest due to my condition. I've already contacted my workplace to take leave starting tomorrow. Oh well, so you're slacking off from work now too? Must be nice. This morning sickness thing. Well, it makes sense. You would be a burden to everyone at work in this condition. So if you're going to be home from tomorrow, I don't need to do the chores, right? It's only fair since you're going to be home slacking off. 
Kevin, have you been talking to your dad recently? Does he know about Alicia's condition? Well, no, I haven't talked to my dad recently. I do keep in touch with my mom and I've told her about the situation, so I think she has informed my dad. Considering Alicia's situation and your current attitude, Kevin, I cannot allow her to return home. We will take Alicia in for a while. What? Don't spoil Alicia, please. Well, we are sorry, but regarding this matter, we need to apologize to your parents. We would like to visit when your father is present. Also, what happened last night? We tried contacting you multiple times, or perhaps you were too busy with work? I wonder if Kevin noticed that my mom's eyes were not smiling even though she was. He made a tense face and said, Okay, I understand. I'll make arrangements. Last night I was working. I've been busy recently. Excuse me. And he left the room. Then the doctor came for the final check before discharging me. After finishing the examination, the doctor explained how I should take care of myself from tomorrow onwards. He then addressed Kevin. You're Alicia's husband, right? Alicia is going through a tough time right now, so please take care of her. Try to do the chores so that she can rest her body. To which Kevin replied, Doctor, what are you talking about? It's just morning sickness. Well, I understand from your position you have to say that to avoid complaints, right? Don't worry, I'll make sure Alicia does what she needs to do. When we have a family meeting, my parents will surely reprimand her too. Now, if you'll excuse me. And he left. The doctor, puzzled, offered, He seems to misunderstand something. Should I explain it to him more thoroughly? My mother responded with a smile. No, it's all right. We'll handle this on our end. I'm sorry for the unpleasant scene you had to witness. My parents seemed lost in quiet contemplation. A month passed and my health finally began to stabilize. The time had come to go to Kevin's family home and resolve things once and for all. That said, I hadn't been in touch with Kevin much in the months since I had returned home, and I had no idea how far things had progressed with Mona. I had no clue where the discussion would lead. I'm sorry for the inconvenience caused by my extended stay at my parents' home due to morning sickness. It's not a bother at all. Are you feeling better now? Be careful not to push yourself too hard. While my father-in-law expressed concern for my health, Kevin and my mother-in-law gave me condescending smirks. Thank you. In fact, Kevin mentioned that Alicia's morning sickness was an act of indulgence, which is distressing for us as her parents. Eh? Morning sickness as an indulgence? Kevin, did you say that? Eh, uh, well, isn't that right, Mom? No, it just seems to be lasting too long. You're better now, aren't you, Alicia? That's good. My mother-in-law hastily tried to end the conversation. No, we need to clarify this, mother-in-law. You are worried that Alicia, being older, might not be able to give birth to a healthy child. You plan to arrange a remarriage between your young former student and Kevin? How far have the discussions with this young uh, Miss Mona, was it, progressed? Eh? What is this all about? Has my wife really said such a disrespectful thing? No, it's not like that. It was a joke, a joke. Eh? A joke? Mom, what do you mean? We've already had a meal with Mona, and I really like her. After this, we will divorce Alicia for failing to do housework and clean alimony. Then I will marry Mona, right? At Kevin's words, everyone fell silent. An uneasy silence filled the air. My mother-in-law turned pale, and my father-in-law was red in the face. It seems there has been some outrageous discussions happening without my knowledge. For today, please go home. I will have a proper conversation with these two. I apologize for the situation. Once again, I ended up returning to my parents' house. I felt like I might never return to that house again. A few days later, I learned a surprising fact from my father. Kevin had received disciplinary action from his company. The reason was maternity harassment. He had committed maternity harassment against a woman in his department. It's evidence that you're slacking off if you get sick just because you're pregnant. Work is not your place to relax. If you don't want to work, then go home. He would assign heavy lifting tasks to visibly pregnant women. Can't you even do this? You're just a burden on the company. Ugh, you should just quit already. You're a nuisance to everyone. Apparently, it was awful. There were several victims, and they seemed to have reported him to the company's compliance department. My father, who has connections with Kevin's company, apparently got the information. Kevin said, But mom taught me that. I just said what mom said. What's wrong with that? I think the same way in my heart, but in public, I pretend to be kind to pregnant women and worry about them if they're not feeling well. Don't you understand that? Then you knew that even if you thought so, you shouldn't say it out loud to Alicia, right? Why did you say such a thing to Kevin? Why did you do something that would lead to their divorce? Kevin seemed to understand nothing, so I thought I could guide him to divorce. I thought Mona, being young, would listen to me. She admires me after all, and I'm sure she'll agree to live with us. Alicia is just too headstrong and I don't prefer. It seemed my mother-in-law had arranged everything behind the scenes. My father-in-law didn't know anything and Kevin was just a pawn in her game. 
Afterwards, I was incessantly contacted by Kevin. I was deceived by mom. I was just misunderstood. I didn't know anything. Please forgive me. I will treasure you and our baby from now on. Oh, just the other day you were telling me to get rid of this baby, weren't you? It's too late to start caring now. We're getting a divorce. Please live happily with Mona. We had this back and forth many times. Kevin's words, just get rid of it, that I had heard while I was fainting deeply wounded my heart. It was something I simply couldn't forgive. On the other hand, I learned that Mona was not aware of Kevin's marital status and had only agreed to have dinner with him because my mother-in-law suggested it, assuring her it would avoid complications at work. Apparently, she didn't become a teacher because she admired my mother-in-law, nor did she hold any particular affection for her. When she found out about my mother-in-law's manipulation, she was genuinely shocked and looked down on her. She had just been unwittingly dragged into all of this. I was worried that getting a divorce would be difficult, but my father-in-law stepped in. He scolded and persuaded both Kevin and my mother-in-law, and we were able to finalize the divorce. I deeply regret that Kevin hurt you in such a difficult time of pregnancy. As a father, I feel extremely guilty. I am also sorry for my wife's actions and for not having monitored her properly, which caused a great deal of discomfort. He apologized from his heart. He paid for Kevin's alimony and child support in a lump sum, and apparently planned to make Kevin repay him in installments. I was able to smoothly finalize the divorce thanks to you, father-in-law. Please come visit us when the baby is born. I'd love to, but hold off for now. I need to straighten out Kevin and my wife and keep a close watch on them. Besides, if they found out I was secretly meeting you, they might go off the rails again. I don't want to expose you or my grandchild to any more danger. Kevin resigned from his job, which he had been disciplined at. He said it was too hard to stay at the company. He tried to find another job, but seemed to be having a hard time sticking to one. He's living with his mother under his father's watchful eye, and it seems he's having a rough time. Rumors about Mona's situation spread in my mother-in-law's workplace, and it seems everyone is giving her strange looks. The teaching world is a rapid turnover of school reassignments every three to eight years, which apparently makes it easier for rumors to spread. Even without this rumor, my mother-in-law is already a dubious person, so people around her were likely thinking she might do something like this. I wonder if she was shocked to find out that Mona, whom she thought admired her, actually disliked her. Lately, she seems to have become very quiet at work. After safely giving birth to a girl, as expected, Kevin pleaded, Please let me see my daughter. I have a right since I'm paying child support. I responded formally. Child support payments and visitation rights are separate legal obligations and not exchangeable. We decided during the divorce that you would pay child support and we would not have visitation. Therefore, I decline your request for a visit. After that, he stopped contacting me. However, sometimes I wonder if it was right to deprive my child of her father based on my feelings. After all, it was my mother-in-law who was the real mastermind, and Kevin was merely brainwashed. When I confessed this story to my mother, she said, Indeed, Kevin is a kind person, but I wonder, who is he the kindest to? If he's kindest to you and his daughter, it might be okay to let him see her. What do you think? Indeed, Kevin is kind, but he's the kindest to himself. Or rather, he's only kind to himself. That's why when I was sick and became a burden to his life, he was filled with negative feelings towards me and ended up going along with my mother-in-law's plan. I can't trust the person who pushed me away when I was weak and needed help. I might ask my daughter if she wants to meet him when she's old enough to have her own opinions, but until then, I don't plan to let her see him. My world completely changed after my daughter was born. Parenting is really fun, but it's also very challenging. I plan to take maternity leave for a while to focus on parenting, and then return to work after leaving my daughter at daycare. I decided to live at my parents' house during my maternity leave. I'm considering finding an apartment near my parents' house where I can live with my daughter soon. Since then, I secretly contacted my father-in-law and asked him to visit us once without informing Kevin. Seeing him carefully and tenderly lift my daughter in his arms, I couldn't help but wish he could visit more often. He didn't take any photos of my daughter. He said if he took any, he might keep looking at them at home and then his wife and Kevin would find out. Instead, I took a lot of pictures of him and my daughter together. I plan to make an album and present it to him one day. I'm incredibly fortunate. I have the support of my parents and a job to return to. Sometimes I wonder what would have happened if my morning sickness had been lighter and I had continued to live with Kevin. Would he have cooperated with me when childcare became difficult, thinking of our daughter and working together to overcome challenges? Would he have risked his own life to protect our daughter when danger loomed? When I think about this, I feel glad that my severe morning sickness exposed Kevin's true character early on. Maybe it was my daughter who made me aware of this. From now on, I plan to appreciate the kindness of those around me and move forward with my daughter looking ahead. Hey, Nellie, do you even realize what you've done? 
How could you neglect your duties as a wife and burden Sal like this? You're the worst wife ever. I'll teach you a lesson. Um, mother-in-law? There's a reason I left. I don't care. We've decided to move to a brand new beautiful apartment. If you want to live with us, I'll tell you where it is. <laughs> mother-in-law probably still doesn't know the whole story. I thought this might actually work in my favor. No thanks, I'm good. <laughs> huh? My name is Nellie, a 35-year-old office worker. I've been married to Sal for five years. He's currently 40, so there's a five-year age gap between us. I've always been attracted to older men, and I fell for Sal because he's so calm and kind. Our relationship progressed smoothly, and we got married. Our married life was pretty good. But a few months ago, I could see the end of our peaceful life. I've been laid off. What? Sal was suddenly laid off. The company was struggling due to an economic downturn. I never thought Sal would be laid off, especially since he worked for a major corporation. I assumed we'd continue to live comfortably on his good salary, but nothing in life is guaranteed. We were suddenly in a tight spot. I used to be a homemaker, but I decided to start working again. I reached out to the company I left when we got married, thinking they might not rehire me, but luckily they did. Apparently someone had just quit after giving birth. This job saved us from a total crisis. If Sal could find another job, we'd be okay. But it's tough for middle-aged men to find work. So he could only get a part-time job, earning around $700 a month. My salary isn't that high either, since I'm returning to work after five years. It's just enough for the two of us to get by. Hey, our rent is high. Should we move somewhere cheaper? I think it'd be better to save some money. To make our lives easier, we needed to cut our fixed costs. We used to live in a nice apartment because of Sal's high salary. But we should face reality and move to an apartment that's hundreds of dollars cheaper. However, Sal quickly shot down my suggestion. No, we're not moving. Why not? If we move to smaller, cheaper apartment, my mom will ask why. I didn't get it. We can just tell her the truth that you were laid off and things are tough now. When I said that, Sal's face turned red and he raised his voice. Stop it. Never tell my mom I was laid off. We can pay the rent with your salary and my earnings. We're fine as we are. I was shocked and frustrated. Is his pride and reputation more important than our well-being? Even if we can barely pay the rent, we're struggling and can't save any money. That's why I suggested moving. But once Sal's mind is made up, there's no changing it. So I had no choice but to give up. Our tough days continued, and then Sal said something unbelievable to me. Hey. Is this all we're having for dinner today? We used to have more dishes back in the day. Are you slacking off now that you're working? You should balance things better. I was so frustrated by my husband's words that I snapped back. Times are tough, you know. I'm doing my best with both housework and my job. We have to cut back on food expenses because someone insists on living in this place due to their pride. Or maybe you could earn more. That'd be nice. When I made that provocative remark, my husband lost it. What the hell? Don't throw that in my face. Just watch. I'll get a job at a better company and earn more than you. That's my husband getting angry like that. He can be so tedious. But if this lights a fire under him, maybe it's for the best. However... The reality was that he couldn't find a full-time job and had to settle for part-time gigs. He wasn't studying or getting any certifications. He was just working part-time. Every time he went for an interview, he felt disrespected. 
especially by younger interviewers. Eventually, he gave up job hunting altogether. It was disappointing, especially after he had so passionately declared he'd earn more than me. But my problems weren't just with my husband. It was my mother-in-law. Mother-in-law is the person who does not hesitate to call me even though I am at work. She had already called over 10 times just this morning. When I called her back during my lunch break, she started yelling right away, Pick up the phone immediately when I call! Mother-in-law, I've told you I'm at work, right? I don't care about your little job. My calls come first. Ever since my father-in-law passed away a year ago, she's been calling me incessantly. Most of her calls were about checking if I was supporting her son properly. And now that she's heard I've started working, she's been calling even more frequently during my work hours. So, have you talked to Sal about it? I haven't heard back from him. I'm sorry, but moving in together is difficult right now. I don't care about your opinion. There's no way Sal would oppose it. Well, he's also finding it a bit challenging. Plus, we're financially tight right now. That's impossible. Sal works at a big company. He must be earning well. I always find myself at a loss for words when she says this. My husband asked me not to tell her about his layoff, so I can't tell her the truth. She probably thinks I'm lying about our financial struggles. Her calls are relentless, not just during work hours, but also when I'm at home. Look, a wife should prioritize supporting her husband, and valuing your husband means valuing his mother. You haven't visited us in a while. You should come over. But I'm exhausted from my full-time job, and my husband's part-time job even takes up some of his weekends, so we hardly have any days off together. So... Our days don't match. Sorry, both my husband and I are so busy that it's hard to coordinate our schedules. I don't care about your convenience. Besides, Sal is off on the weekends, right? One of you can come over. Mother-in-law seemed quite frustrated and kept pushing. I was about to reach my limit and decided to tell her the truth about my husband. Well, my husband is working on weekends, too. What? What do you mean? Actually, just as I was about to spill the beans, my husband, who had been lounging on the sofa watching TV, rushed over and grabbed my phone. Mom! Sorry I haven't been able to visit lately. I'm working on a big project right now and even working on weekends. I promise I'll come to see you once things settle down. With that, he hung up and handed my phone back. Why did you do that without asking me? Why were you about to tell my mom everything? We should just be honest? She'll keep misunderstanding and nagging me forever. I don't want her to know. Just drop your silly pride for once. Shut up. You've been living off me and now you're talking back? He stormed off to his room. Life was already stressful and on top of that I had to deal with mother-in-law's snide remarks and my husband's selfishness. He always said his part-time day job was tough and never did any housework. He wasn't working full-time, just working on the weekends and maybe once or twice during the week. I wish he'd either find another job or at least help with the chores. Or I want you to remember housework and take the initiative. He's not pulling his weight and I'm the one earning more yet he complains about everything. I decided to leave home for a while. I went back to my parents' house for about a week to make him realize the difficulty of household chores. I had told my parents everything about our situation. They kept saying, you should get a divorce. But I didn't want to give up so easily. We had been married for five years, and it was a love marriage. If we were to divorce... I wanted to try everything possible to make it work. Sure enough, my husband called when I got to my parents. Hey, when are you coming back? What about my dinner? I won't be back for a while. You'll have to do the chores yourself. What? 
Stop joking and come back and do the chores. No, I won't. I want you to understand how hard it is. Do all the cleaning, laundry, and cooking. You'll realize how tough it was for me to do all that while working. I hung up. He called several times, but I ignored them all. Life at my parents was so comfortable. Chores were divided among the three of us, and my mom cooked delicious meals, saying, You must be tired. It felt so good to have meals served without doing anything. I stayed at my parents for about a week. I wanted to stay longer, but my workplace was far from my parents, and I thought my husband might have realized the difficulty of household chores by now. I returned home after a long time. I was worried the house might be a mess, but it was cleaner than I expected. However, something felt off. Could it be? I checked my husband's room and noticed his clothes and suitcase were missing. He must have gone to mother-in-law's. I called him. What do you want now? Where are you? At my parents' house. You didn't go there right after I left, did you? That's right. What are you thinking? That defeats the purpose. It's your fault for leaving in the first place. I'm angry. I'm not coming back. What do you mean? I'm going to live with my mom. You're moving back home? No. <laughs> we rented a new apartment and moved in. <laughs> what? I was confused. As I was searching for words, the voice on the phone changed. Hey, Nellie, do you realize what you've done? How dare you abandon your duties and burden Sal? You're the worst wife ever. I'll teach you a lesson. Look, mother-in-law, I had my reasons for leaving. I don't care. We've moved to a new, beautiful apartment. You want to join, right? If you agree to live with us, I'll tell you where it is. <laughs> she probably didn't know anything. I thought this might work to my advantage. No, thanks. <laughs> what? She was taken aback by my quick refusal. So, I won't be coming. You mean you'll live alone? You've been relying on Sal. You can't survive on your own. Don't worry. I earn enough to live by myself. If we're not living together, there's no need for us to be married. So, I'll divorce him. What? Both mother-in-law and my husband sounded shocked. Wait, Nellie, we don't need a divorce. I can't continue this marriage. I want to get away from a useless husband like you. When I belittled him, mother-in-law was furious. How dare you speak to Sal like that? We don't need a wife like you. Sal, divorce her now. Well... I'll prepare the divorce papers. You'll regret this. It's too late to apologize now. I'd say the same to you. She hung up. I'm sure mother-in-law and my husband will come here with the divorce papers. Things are moving in my favor. I've given up on him since he went back to mother-in-law without any remorse. He won't change. There's no need to be together. I started packing my things, expecting them to arrive soon. A few hours later, mother-in-law showed up alone. Where's Sal? He doesn't need to see you. Here, he's already filled out his part. Fill out yours quickly. Mother-in-law thrust the divorce papers at me. I couldn't help but notice that my husband's handwriting seemed shaky. He's such a kind soul. How could he hesitate to divorce a terrible wife like you? I'll never forgive you for causing him trouble. Enjoy your miserable life and regret this. She yelled at me as I filled out my part. My husband never had the guts to tell mother-in-law the truth because of his pride. What a pathetic man. What happened to your family home? We sold it so you can't just move in. <laughs> I wouldn't want to anyway. How much did you sell it for? It was pretty old. 
that's none of your business. But I'll tell you anyway, <laughs> we sold it for about 50k. Not a huge amount, but it helps. Sal will cover the rent for our new apartment. Really? I'm surprised he passed the credit check. What are you talking about? Sal earns a good salary, of course he passed. Did you put that 50k into Sal's account? Why? Oh, you figured it out. But who cares? Stop prying. It's clear you're still hung up on him. But it's too late. It's fine. I'll file the divorce papers. She stormed off huffing and puffing. I was thrilled to finally be free from them. I packed the rest of my things, moved them to my parents' house, and then found an apartment for myself. I cleverly provoked mother-in-law so I didn't have to split any assets. You think I'd give you any of Sal's precious assets? Remembering my husband's pale face during the asset division discussion still makes me laugh. Two years later, I got a call from an unknown number one morning. I wonder who it is in the morning hours before going to work. Thinking it might be work-related, I answered. It was mother-in-law. Ha! Ah, Nelly, please help. Mother-in-law, I don't think you should be calling me. We're strangers now. Don't say that. I'm in trouble. Let me guess. You can't pay the apartment rent and you've run out of savings. How did you... You never knew about his restructuring, did you? You knew? Yes. I tried to tell you many times, but Sal always stopped me. I'm so sorry, Nellie. Can you come back? No. He never tried to change, no matter how much I told him. And you always bullied me. I don't want to be with people like that ever again. Please, I'm at my wit's end. We don't even have food. According to mother-in-law, my husband kept up appearances, never revealing his restructuring. He paid the rent from the 50k mother-in-law got from selling the house. He also splurged occasionally, fearing mother-in-law would get suspicious if he didn't. Living like that, the 50k disappeared in no time, and it seems they're now broke. You brought this on yourselves. Why not let go of your pride, move to a cheaper apartment, and live modestly? I... I didn't expect this. I thought my talented son would support me and I'd have a comfortable retirement. Mother-in-law sobbed. I quietly hung up and blocked her number. Just to be safe, I also filed a restraining order and made sure I could report any issues immediately. Honestly, both mother and son only think about relying on others. I'll use them as a cautionary tale and strive to be independent. With that thought, I refocused on the task at hand. My name is Claire and I'm a college student. I was born when my parents were older and I have a sister who is 12 years older than me. My sister is incredibly kind and responsible. She has a strong sense of responsibility. When she got married, I couldn't help but feel really lonely. She married pretty young, tying then out with her college classmate, Walt, right after graduation. Seeing her so happy on her wedding day, I truly wished her all the happiness in the world. But before I even got to high school, my dad passed away suddenly. One morning we found him collapsed in the hallway. He was gone just like that. It was a shock, especially for my mom, who took it really hard. My parents had been inseparable, so the loss was unimaginable for her. Seeing mom so down, my sister and her husband offered to move in with us. Though mom and I initially declined, feeling it would be an imposition, my responsible sister couldn't bear to see mom struggling. So, in a way, she insisted in the four of us 
Mom, me, my sister, and her husband started living together. Walt is a friendly guy and always treated me warmly, calling me little Claire. He also cared for mom, and I believe he's a good person. However, I was in high school, full of teenage angst. Having a young man in the house who wasn't related by blood made me feel really uneasy. There were days when I just didn't want to go home at all. Still, I focused on my studies and earned a state college recommendation, mostly to give mom some peace of mind. She was thrilled when she found out. Claire, you're such a hard worker, she said, hugging me with a smile. But before I started college, mom passed away. She had been dealing with a chronic illness that suddenly worsened, and she was gone just like that. Now facing college without either of my parents, I told myself I have to be strong. You see, I was born when my parents were older. I knew that I would have to say goodbye to my parents earlier than most people my age. So the sadness of this parting was expected. I always told myself I had to be strong and started living my life with that resolve. All I had to do was get through college and graduate and everything would be fine. However, after my mom passed away, Walt, my sister's husband, changed his behavior towards me, making life even more challenging. My sister had recently gotten a promotion and was too busy to handle household chores. At a time when I was a student with a relatively flexible schedule, I ended up taking on the household chores. Around the same period, Walt was laid off. While constantly saying, I've got to find a job, Walt would just lounge around the house without lifting a finger to help with any chores. It became expected that I would make all the meals. If I cooked something he didn't like, he'd blatantly say, I can't eat this, and throw it away right in front of me. I was both sad and furious, but he was my sister's husband. He never treated me like that in front of her. I didn't want to cause any issues in their marriage, so I kept my mouth shut. However, Walt's behavior continued to worsen. Whenever I came home from college, someone from Walt's family was always at our house. Most of the time, it was Walt's parents. Not only Walt's, but also his parents started treating our house as if it were their own. They'd open our fridge and bring in their stuff, even hiding it in the closet. Every time they saw me, both Walt and his parents would suggest that I should move out soon. Claire, you're in college now. You should be living on your own. We kept quiet because you are our dear sister-in-law. But it's been a while since mom passed away, hasn't it? You must be feeling more subtle now. Exactly! It's weird for you to keep living with your sister and her husband. Becoming independent is part of growing up, Claire. You need to do that soon. Exhausted from their constant nagging, I just respond with a dismissive, sure. I had been hearing comments like, You should move out when you go to college so I don't look like a weirdo. From Walt since high school, so their words hardly phased me. I wondered if I was the strange one, but I just couldn't bring myself to leave the house, filled with memories of my parents. More importantly, I was afraid that if I left, Walt and his parents would completely take over the house. One day, Walt was in a particularly bad mood and pestered me more than usual while I was folding laundry. When are you moving out? This is my home. I don't want to leave. Look, Claire, how much money did you get when your mother passed? What? Confused, I listened as Walt continued. You got some money, right? Use that to move out. If you're going to stay here, you'll have to pay rent. Even Kyra is getting annoyed because you're still here. My sister is? My sister was always exhausted from her demanding job, coming home worn out every day. She would apologize, saying... I'm sorry for leaving all the housework to me. She was so run down that I had to tell her you should get some rest, even when she tried to help with just the dishes. I didn't want to burden her anymore, 
so I took on all the household duties to be of some help. To think she found me a bother? I was so shocked, my hands froze. You must realize it's weird, right? Living with a married couple? Kyra is just putting up with you. She probably finds you annoying. Maybe you're even the reason we can't have kids. Walt said with a smirk. I couldn't believe his words. My sister would never say that. Should never say that. But his words hurt me nonetheless. I couldn't bear to be in the same room with Walt any longer, so I ran out into the pouring rain. I grabbed an umbrella on my way out, but it wasn't enough to keep me dry. Soaked through, I found myself standing at the bus stop. I had been waiting there for my sister to come home. Hours later, she showed up looking tired and worn out. I couldn't hold back my tears any longer as I rushed towards her shouting, Sis! Claire? She said, visibly surprised to see me. What are you doing out here? You're soaked! Do you find me annoying, sis? Am I a burden for you and Walt? Am I the reason you can't have children? Of course not. What's gotten into you? My questions clearly rattled her, but I had to know. Is it weird that I'm living with you? She took me to a late night cafe to calm me down, patting my crying back all the way. Over a warm drink, I told her everything. I kept silent because I didn't want to burden her, but I realized I couldn't handle it alone anymore. Maybe Walt was sizing up my worth, thinking of how much money he could get from me. They probably planned to squeeze that amount of rent out of me. My sister, swamped with work, had no idea any of this was happening at home. I'm sorry I didn't notice. She apologized to me repeatedly. We both regretted that I hadn't said anything sooner. Once I had calmed down, my sister declared, I won't forgive Walt for pushing my dear sister this far. We're going to have a proper talk. Father-in-law and mother-in-law will be there, of course. My sister, who lately only wore a tired expression, had eyes bursting with anger. Her fury snapped me awake. I finally realized the people in the wrong weren't me, but Walt and his parents. My sister managed to take some time off work and told Walt and his parents that we needed to talk. Walt seemed confused, unsure why a discussion was needed, but after my sister told him, you can't forget what you've done to Claire, he seemed to catch on. Feeling it was too risky for her to be alone with Walt, my sister rented a weekly apartment for me. She stayed there herself until the day of the discussion. When the day arrived, Walt, who seemed to have expected the topic to be about home ownership, immediately began speaking. So, this is about who owns the house, right? I've been living here for years. I'm the man, and Kyra married into my family, so the house should naturally belong to us. If Claire just leaves, that'll settle it. Exactly, Walt. You moved here to take care of your mother-in-law. You should be grateful, added his mother. But Walt, you've done nothing. You may have had kind words from my mother, but never acted on them. She even had to make your lunch for work. I responded calmly, leaving Walt's mother speechless. My sister then began. Do you not realize how ridiculous you sound? Walt says he owns the house because he's lived here for many years. But Claire has lived here much longer, ever since she was a child. Well, I lived here as an adult, so it should be mine. Walt countered. By that logic, I moved back as an adult too. So doesn't it also become my house? My sister responded. I'm the man and Kyra is the woman. So naturally, I should own the house, Walt exclaimed. Home ownership has nothing to do with being male or female, my sister snapped back. Stumped by your words, Walt seemed to mumble something under his breath. Walt's parents looked at each other, clearly troubled. The room fell into a tense silence, broken only by my sister's authoritative voice. Get a divorce. With that, she handed Walt pre-filled divorce papers. Shocked, Walt pushed the papers back. 
Why, we were just discussing who owns the house. You misunderstood. I came here today to discuss divorce. His voice feeble, Walt asked, Why? Getting laid off wasn't your fault, but you barely even looked for another job. I heard it all from Claire. You didn't help with the housework either. You told me you and Claire shared chores. That's a lie. Walt had been pretending to look for work, all while lying about helping me with chores. My sister had learned the truth when I mentioned doing all the housework myself at a cafe. Walt stammered, struggling to find the right words, but my sister was unforgiving. This house legally belongs to Claire. Only those she approves of can live here. Entering without the homeowner's consent is trespassing. Claire, what would you like to do? Straightening my back, I answered clearly. Walt and his parents should never set foot in this house again. This is my home, filled with memories of my mom and dad. I won't allow it to be taken away. I first learned that I was the homeowner of this house for my sister. My mom had left me the house, thinking it would be a problem if I had nowhere to live if something happened to her. Walt and his parents had a lot to say about that. My house was located downtown, so the location was great. Walt's parents loved it and had even started preparations to move in. They used to run a restaurant together, but closed it because they were planning to move. Just when we can't move in anymore, we even started arranging for renovations. Walt's dad revealed that they had almost started remodeling my house without my consent. What's more, it turned out my sister and her husband were supposed to pay for the renovation. Since Walt wasn't earning any money, this would naturally come out of my sister's pocket. Fed up with the outrageous demands from Walt and his parents, my sister feigned calling the police. The three of them left in haste. We sent Walt's belongings, along with the personal items his parents had hidden in our closet, back to their family home and cut all ties. My sister consulted a lawyer and filed for divorce. Even after the divorce was finalized, Walt and his parents were occasionally lurking around our house, so we reported it to the police. After the police intensified patrols, treating it as a stalking case, Walt and his parents stopped coming near our house. Their life became very difficult afterward. With their restaurant closed, Walt's parents were jobless. Walt was also unemployed, struggling to make ends meet every day. Now, my sister and I live happily together in the home we protected.